What's up, y'all? It's your girl from Tangy Bush, South Carolina. And if y'all remember my video about three, four months ago, I did a video on the Democrat candidates. And you know me, I was going for the minorities, but there wasn't too many, except that Puerto Rican lady that was kind of slipping up. So my only other choice would be Elizabeth Warren. So here we go. This is part one, because it's a live stream and it's a long ass speech. So I got to do it in parts. So let's go with part one. Let's go. Buffering. Buffering. I'll put my life in Buffering for a long time. He sold carpet, 
He sold fencing. He sold housewares. And when I was in middle school, uh, the boys were all gone by then. So it was just my mom and my daddy and me. And my daddy had a massive heart attack. And um, we thought we were going to lose him. Now, he pulled through, but he couldn't work for a long, long time. And even now, I can remember the day we lost our family station wagon. Um, I can remember how my mother used to tuck me in at night, and she'd kiss me on the forehead, and she'd pull my blankets up and pat me and smile. I always knew what was coming next. She'd walk outside my bedroom, close the door, and then I'd hear her start to cry. She never wanted to cry in front of me. This was the time when I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. And one day, I walked into my folks' bedroom and laid out on the bed was the dress. Now, some of you here will know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And there's the dress. And at the foot of the bed, there's my mother. She's in her slip and her stocking feet. And she's pacing. She's got her head down. And she's saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She had never worked outside the home. And she was terrified. And she looked up and saw me. I'm standing in the door. I'm just a kid. She didn't say anything. She looked at me. And she looked at that dress. And she looked at me. And she wiped her face. She pulled on that dress. She walked to the Sears. And she got a full-time minimum wage job answering phones. That minimum wage job saved our house. And more importantly, it saved our family. It is the lesson my mother taught me. And that is, no matter how scared you are, no matter how hard it looks, when it comes down to it, you reach down deep, you find what you have to find, you pull it up, and you take care of the people you love. That's it. And it was years later that I came to understand. That wasn't just the lesson my mother taught me. It's what millions of people do across this country every day. Millions of people, no matter how scared they are, no matter how hard it looks, they reach down deep, they find what they have to find, they pull it up, they take care of themselves, and they take care of the people they love. That's what we do. But it was only years after that that I came to understand that same story is also a story about government. Because when I was a girl, a full-time minimum wage job in America would support a family of three. It would pay a mortgage, it would cover the utilities, and it would put food on the table. Today, a full-time minimum wage job in America will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. That is wrong, and that is why I am in this fight. <laughs> Understand this. The reason for the difference is who government works for. When I was a girl, the question asked about the minimum wage is what does it take a family of three to get along in this country? What does it take a family of three to get a toehold in America's middle class? What does it take a family of three to have something solid that they can build from? 
Today, the question asked in Washington is where do we set the minimum wage to maximize the profits for giant multinational corporations? Well, I don't want a government that works for giant multinational corporations. I want one that works for our families. So, like I said, the boys, they went off and they joined the military. That was their path, their chance in America's middle class. Me, I had a different theory. I have known what I wanted to be since second grade. You may laugh. You didn't decide until what, fourth grade? Fifth, I can tell. I can tell. Yeah, fess up. Okay. No, but I've known what I wanted to be since second grade, and I've never wavered from it. I wanted to be a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's <laughs> for being tough but fair. Boy, it's what I wanted. Dang, did I want this. By the time I graduated from high school, my family didn't have the money for college application, much less to send me to four years at university. So, like a lot of Americans, I do not have a straight path story. I have a story that has some twists and turns in it. So here's how my twists and turns go. Um, I got a scholarship to college. Go debaters. Yeah. And then at 19, I fell in love, got married, dropped out, and got a minimum wage job. Yay. <laughs> uh, I picked it. It was my choice. It would be a good life. But it wasn't a dream. It wasn't the thing I wanted to do. And then we're living down in Texas, down in Houston. And uh, I found it, a commuter college, 45 minutes away, and it cost $50 a semester. Yeah, yeah. On a price that I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job, I got the chance to finish my four-year diploma, and I became a special education teacher. <laughs> lived my dream job. Uh, I love this work. We got any public school teachers in here? Any special education teachers? Okay, so I'm going to count on you to back me up on this. It's not a job. It's calling. It is. I love those children. Uh, I had uh, uh, four to six year olds, mostly, and uh, to this day, I can remember I can remember their faces. I can remember things we worked on. To tell you the truth, I probably would still be doing this work today. But my story has some more twists and turns. And here's how they go. By the end of the first year, I was visibly pregnant. And the principal did what principals did in those days. He wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. So... Here I am, on my home, I can't get a job, what am I going to do, I've got to do something, uh, I know, I'll go to law school. <laughs> so, by this time we're living in New Jersey, and uh, I found a state law school, cost $450 a semester, uh, but baby on hip, I head off to law school, do three years of law school, graduate visibly pregnant. You will discover a pattern to these stories. Uh, in fact, uh, with uh, my son Alex, who was good enough to wait until after graduation to be born. Thank you, Alex. Uh, you know, you've got to have a little cooperation here. 
um, took the bar and practiced law for 45 minutes. <laughs> and then I went back to my first love, which is teaching. I traded little ones for big ones and spent most of my grown up life teaching in law school. Made other changes in my Uh, husband number one, hint, it is never a good sign when you have to number your husbands. <laughs> and uh, husband number one and I parted ways. But I found number two, that's Bruce, and I still got it. So, it worked. It worked. Good man. When you find a good one, hang on. Uh, so, um, I, here I am, I'm teaching in law school, and what I taught, I don't know if everybody does this, but for somebody who kind of grew up on the ragged edge of the middle class, I taught everything about money. I was interested, I wanted to learn it, I wanted to know every detail, and then I turned around and teach it. So I taught contract law and commercial law, I taught payment systems and secured transactions, I taught the Uniform Commercial Code, I taught bankruptcy law, their creditor law, law and economics, corporate finance, partnership finance. If it was about money, I learned it and then I taught. Um, but there was always one central question that I worked on. And that is, what's happening to American families in this country? Why is America's middle class being hollowed out? Why is it that people who work every day bit as hard as my mother worked two generations ago, today find the path so much rockier and so much steeper. And for people of color, even rockier and even steeper. Why? And the answer is like the answer on minimum wage. It's who government works for, who that government in Washington is helping out. Think of it this way. We have a government that works fabulously for giant drug companies, just not for people trying to get a prescription filled. Can I have an amen on that? We have a government that works great for people who want to invest and make money off private prisons and private detention centers, just not for the people whose lives are destroyed and whose communities are torn apart. We have a government that works tremendously well for giant oil companies that want to drill everywhere, just not for the rest of us who see climate change bearing down upon us. And when you see a government that works really great for those with money and not so well for everyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple, and we need to call it out for what it is. drugs, it's student loan debt, it's child care, it's climate, whatever is the issue that you care about deep down, I guarantee you this, if there's a decision to be made in Washington, it's been influenced by money. It's been nudged by money. It's been shaped by money. It's been moved over by money. In fact, let me tell you a story about this. Um, it gives you an idea of how money flows everywhere. 
Yes, it's about campaign contributions, but so much more. You know, go back to the 1990s and early 1990s. You go back and read, and basically, as a country, as a world, we understood what was happening with climate change. We didn't have the word climate, we were calling it global warming, but we knew that putting all this carbon into the air, everyone was to play out the models and say, this is going to be bad. There's a little variation on how long it was going to take. This is going to be bad. Right? We knew this. And here's the thing. In Washington, Democrats and Republicans were working together. This wasn't a partisan issue. They were working together. They were concerned. Do we need to give more authority to the EPA? Do we need more money in the cleanup? What, what kind of things do we need to be doing? So they're working together. And then... Along come the Koch brothers. Oh, you've heard of the Koch brothers, <laughs> I can tell. The Koch brothers and the big oil companies, the fossil fuel industry, and the giant polluters. And they get together, in effect, and say, wow, huh, if Congress gets serious about this climate business, they change the regulations and it's going to bite into our bottom line. This is going to cost us our profits. So they've got an investment decision to make. They can see this coming just like everybody else can. What could they do? They could say, you know what? We're going to get out of carbon based. We're going to move into clean. And no, they don't do that. They could say, we're going to double down on R&D, on how to take carbon out of the air, how to clean it out of the water. They don't do that. You know what they invest in? Politicians. They invest in Washington. They invest big time in campaign contributions, in lobbyists, in PR firms, in think tanks, in so-called experts. In fact, here I am, college campus. Let's talk about some of those bought and paid for experts for just a minute. Think about this. These are the guys who stand up to deny the science of climate, right? And they say, well, I am a doctor. Of and, <clears throat> and as a doctor, uh, you know, this business about climate, it was warm before, the dinosaurs loved it, it was, uh, everything worked out great. Yeah, so who knows, who knows? What was the, what is the point of that? Why were there people who were spending so much money to lift up those voices, to give them a chance to get out there in front of the cameras? You know why? It's not because those guys didn't understand the science. Nah, they did it because those so-called experts, those climate deniers, they could build something. They could build an umbrella, an umbrella that the politicians could hide under. And keep taking money from the Koch brothers. Keep taking money from the fossil fuel industry. Keep taking money from the big polluters and say, gee, I don't know. You know, it's controversial. I just, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what's going on here. You want to understand the climate crisis we face today? It is 25 years of corruption in Washington that got us here. So, we got big problems, and they really do go everywhere. And to fix this, we can't just pass a statute over here, a couple of regulations over here, you know, we'll change a couple of definitions over here. No, we need big structural change. That's what it is. So, what does that look like? Well, part one, we need to attack the corruption head on. Enough of playing defense, it's time to go on offense against the money. Yeah. 
and I got a plan for that. So, so here it is. Here it is. You wouldn't be surprised to hear this. Since money is everywhere, makes itself felt in so many places in our government, it's got a lot of moving parts to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a sample, okay, a few of the pieces out of this anti-corruption bill. And just so you know, when I say it's got a lot of parts, here's the good news. I have the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. We need the biggest anti-corruption plan since Watergate. So here's how part of it works. End lobbying as we know it. <laughs> Block the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. Here's one you may never have thought about, but it's important. Make the United States Supreme Court follow basic rules of ethics. Okay, okay I could do these all night long. Uh, I really could. But I'm going to do one more. You really want to hose out some corruption? Here's one that'll do it. Make every single person who runs for federal office put their tax returns online. Million is free and clear, but your 50 millionth 
and first dollar, you got to pitch in two cents. And two cents for every dollar after that. And just so everybody remembers how a wealth tax works, anybody in here own a home, own a farm, grew up in a family that owned a home? Yeah, you've been paying a wealth tax forever, right? It's just called a property tax. All I'm saying that's different is when you're above 50 million, and that's, by the way, the top one-tenth of one percent of fortunes in this country, when you get clear up there, it's not only about your real estate, it's about your stock portfolio, the diamonds, the Rembrandt, and the yacht. That's the idea. Think of it all. Now, I have folks say to me, a wealth tax on billionaires? Oh my, <laughs> vapors, that's what billionaires, I think, say about this. Uh, some of them. Um, and here's the thing, they say, we worked hard, we had a great idea, we stayed up late, um, and that's how we got to be billionaires. And my answer is, good for you. That's great. That's fabulous. But you built a great fortune here in America, I guarantee. You built it at least in part using workers. All of us help pay to educate. You built it at least in part, getting your goods to market on roads and bridges. All of us help pay to build. You built it at least in part, protected by police and firefighters. All of us help pay the salaries for. investments we want to make. We want to make those investments so people do have a chance to make it. All we're saying is if you make it big, I mean really big, I mean top one-tenth of one percent big, pitch in two cents so everybody else gets a chance to make it. Yeah.